Hi YouTube, um, it has been quite a while since my last video. Um, I apologize for that. Of course, I just got busy and swept up and doing other things and I neglected to update this, but I recently received, well, I've been receiving a lot of nice comments um, since I uploaded my last video months and months ago. And, but I, in particular, I received one a couple of days ago from a user named Blue Dreamer 19 and it was just a very nice note about how much he or she enjoyed the channel. So I thought I would make an update video. Unfortunately, the regular camera that I use is broken, so I'm going to use my phone and hope for the best. Um, I had, oh, and one of the, I guess one of the new updates is that I now have this neat little old school desk um, as my tarot reading area. I got rid of my other table because it was a little bit unstable. And uh, let's see, so it's got a really neat little storage place underneath it where I can hold all sorts of decks and things like that. It's very neat. I like it a lot. A friend was moving out of town and he was unable to take this with him, so I bought it off of him because I thought it had a lot of charm. Um, so I thought I'd make another video in my Philosophy and Tarot series, and uh, I was originally going to do something with the Pentacles, um, because I had done something with the Wands and with the Cups and things like that before. I was going to do something on dialectical materialism, but that was not as fun, and so I thought I would do something instead on something that is interesting me right now. Uh, which is some further psychoanalytic stuff. So I had an early video on the major arcana of the tarot, the first couple of cards in the major arcana, and how they relate to the ideas of Sigmund Freud and Jacques Lacan in relation to human subjectivity formation. Today I thought I'd make a quick video, well, relatively quick at least, on um, uh, the work of a woman named Melanie Klein and how I see her ideas of projective identification relating to the tarot. So I pulled out these two cards in particular because I think that they're going to illustrate what I'm going to be talking about nicely. And as always, the whole point of this is um, to go through some theoretical and philosophical foundations in order to deepen or broaden our understandings of these particular cards. So uh, a couple of some things on background so that what I'm saying is going to make sense. Um, Melanie Klein was actually a contemporary of Sigmund Freud, and she was one of the first major people to come along and critique him, um, famously at least in a public sense, because psychoanalysis is a very um, father-intensive discipline, if you will, and a lot of people refuse to critique Sigmund Freud on any accounts, at least uh, f for the first couple of years, I guess you could say. But um, Melanie Klein was one of the first people who came along and said that he was incorrect in ignoring the relationship between the child and the mother. So Freud was concerned with the bond between the child and the mother only in the sense that that was pre-Oedipal. And if you don't know what the Oedipus complex is, look it up on Wikipedia. Um, but Melanie Klein, all of, a lot of her work, she is, um, in a lot of ways inaugurated the what's called the British School of Object Relations, even though a lot of her ideas are different from what some people in object relations do. It's all very complicated. But she wanted to pay a lot of attention to the infant-mother dyad um, and explore some of the foundational formative things that happened then, as opposed to when the child experiences repression in the Oedipus complex and forms an ego. So. Uh, she actually picks up on an idea that a lot of Freudians do not like, which is in this book. I've decided I'm going to get even more um, academic and actually start providing you with the books. So not just book recommendations, but I'm actually going to pull out the books now. Um, this is Sigmund Freud's Beyond the Pleasure Principle. In it, this is one of his later works. This is where he actually pr proposes for the first time what is called the death drive. And maybe you've heard of that, maybe you haven't, but this is a major shift in Freud's thinking thinking from just the libido to uh, two fundamental drives. And this drive theory is really the thing which separates psychoanalysis from other forms of psychology. The belief that human beings have incomplete instincts um, that seek uh, satisfaction across a variety of objects. So up until the publication of this, Freud was really concentrated on libido. Um, and that's why everyone says that Freud can only think about sex. But in this later point in his career, after World War I, he theorized that actually the human psyche is composed or it is host to two separate drives the life drive and the death drive. So there is a drive towards um, the continuing of life and there is a drive towards, for lack of a better word, self-destruction. And it gets more complicated than that, but that's probably enough. Um, 
two drives, life drive and death drive, that manifest in different ways. So the life drive manifests as sexuality, the death drive manifests outwardly as aggression towards others. And this was what, the way that Freud um, tried to explain the atrocities of World War I. So, uh, again, a lot of Freudians, including his daughter, Anna Freud, did not like the publication of Beyond the Pleasure Principle. They actually felt like it was an embarrassment, um, and a lot of them ignored the death drive. But Melanie Klein uh, found it to be really useful, and so she began to theorize a system of human subjectivity formation that she called projective identification. And this is basically how it works. The human being has a life drive and a death drive. So an innate compulsion towards satisfying these two things, both towards uh, promoting its life, to continuing its life, to copulating and reproducing, and towards self-destruction, uh, towards ending that life and returning to a state of, uh, I guess you could say, returning to a state, not a state of bliss, but a state of inactivity was, is kind of how it's described in some of the literature. So the human being is born with these two competing drives, and it has a fragmentary early sense of self and ego that cannot really deal with either of those things. So rather than uh, actually experiencing the horrors of the death drive or this feeling, this desire to destroy oneself, those things are projected out into objects in the environment. So this is a, a coping mechanism that the very early ego, the very early infant uses in order to uh, stop the death drive from achieving its aim, I guess you could say. Um, so they're projected out into objects in the environment. Now, Melanie Klein is oftentimes associated with the terms good breast, bad breast, because in her, a lot of her literature, she, she says that the first two objects that she, the, the infant encounters is actually the breast. But this could really be anything. You need to read almost all psychoanalysis metaphorically. So the breast could be anything like a bottle or anything in the environment. But it's an object that the infant has close contact with in the first weeks or months of life. Uh, so these objects become receptacles for the drive, and the infant begins to experience um, the objects as representatives of ultimate life-giving and ultimate life-taking energies. So there's a more complicated process called splitting, where the same object is experienced as two different objects. So let's say that the bottle um, that the infant has contact with on a regular basis becomes split or fragmented in the infant's mind and the infant interprets it as a good bottle and a bad bottle. So the good bottle is the host to the life-giving force, the libido that the infant has projected out and it um, is, it's, it's comforting, it brings the infant sustenance, it loves everything about the good bottle partially because it is experiencing its own libido through that. And then the second bad bottle is when the bottle is absent, so when the infant wants the bottle and it's not there, or the bottle is not as warm as the infant would want it to be. So it becomes this threatening thing that if the bottle does not appear, I will die, says the infant. And so in some sense, the bottle is also bad, and this is the half of the bottle that contains the death drive. So again, the infant is able to interpret these things because really it's a gloss on its own psychical drives and mechanisms that are put into place. Uh, so into the environment, the infant projects these drives, but very soon after, the infant is still experiencing aggression from objects in the environment, unfortunately. So projecting its death drive out of itself into an object in the environment is one way of starting to cope with it, but then the object in the environment is just experienced as aggressive. So in order to save itself, the infant has to interject these objects back into itself, and it gets kind of complicated and weird. but. Um, the purpose is that the fragmentary ego needs something to organize itself around. So it can't just keep projecting everything out. It takes in, for lack of a better term, the good bottle, the loving object, the object which appears to continue the infant's life, the host to the libido or the life drive. It takes in that object as a psychical representation. And Melanie Klein calls this introjection, which is another term that she borrows from Freud. Uh, the infant introjects the good object into itself and begins to organize an inner world and a psychical life around the good object, but it can't stop itself from also interjecting the bad object. So it projects drives out into the environment, experiences its own drives as something separate unto itself, and then incorporates those things back into itself in order to understand or begin to build a psychical world or an inner reality. Uh, 
that you probably are thinking this is really crazy at this point. Maybe it's not a good idea to do a video on such a complicated topic, but um, the whole point, what Melanie Klein was really getting at is an early proposal of, at least in psychoanalysis, about how the self is not only a relational self, but is composed of actual objects that are just glosses or masks on our internal drives. So Freud, and I won't have, don't have time to go into it now, but Freud has a whole lot of other ideas about the drive, but for Melanie Klein, the point is is that we construct ourselves based off of a process of exchange with the objects in our environment. Um, and we are motivated to do that on the basis of drive. So lots of people, that it's not a revolutionary idea to say that the self is made up of all sorts of different experiences that you incorporate. But Melanie Klein's answer is why. It's a psychoanalytic one. And it says, because of these two competing drives, it's why we have this. A lot of people like Melanie Klein because she gives a sense of um, an, an ethic, like for lack of a better term. I mean, she explains why we would want to relate to other people because they are in part ourselves, because we have projected into them and then taken them back into us. And it's a complicated exchange process where um, in the end we, and I didn't go into all of the complications of this, but we start to, we owe people, I guess you could say for lack of a better term. And it gets very complicated Melanie Klein talks about how um, the internalized objects, you know, so the baby takes in the good and the bad object, and uh, uh, in doing so, organizes a sense of self around the good object, but continues to feel persecuted and run from the bad object, um, and so turns its aggression against the bad object, but then realizes that the bad object is actually a person that the infant loves, because it's a, the bottle, or it's a piece of the mother, or it's a piece of the father, or it's the entire mother or father. It gets weird, but the point is we feel bad, because at some point along the way we're aggressive towards the bad objects that we've incorporated, only to find out later on that the bad objects that we've incorporated are actually the things we love too. So it's a complicated process of guilt and pain reparation to people and so it's sort of a psychical explanation for why people should be good to one another or why they feel a need to be good to one another. Um, Melanie Klein is very popular in Britain and especially in some clinical psychoanalytic circles but she's not very well known in the United States partially because Freud and Lacan have had such hold here and because she was such a vocal critic of a lot of Freud's ideas. So I really like her though. Hopefully my explanation makes some sort of sense because now it's time to turn attention to these cards. <laughs> Um, after, what, 12, 12 minutes and 40 seconds of explanation. Um, so I, all of this is to say that I really, sometimes when the Two of Cups come up, comes up in a reading for me, I think about this process of projective identification. So you have the two individuals who are swapping cups uh, with one another. And traditionally, this is a card of love or the card of relationships or things like that. But occasionally, I have come across meanings in books to say that if the reading has nothing to do with love and this comes up, sometimes this is about integrating two halves of oneself or a duality of some sort that is fine finding a way to integrate, but I like to, my gloss on that is a psychoanalytic one. It's the idea of projective identification. So you have two individuals who are both projecting their needs and their drives into one another and then reincorporating the psychical image of the other into themselves. So they're projecting their drives out and then experiencing the drives again as represented from another person. So it sets up the idea of a relationship where the reason that we relate to others is because we are driven to do so and others come to represent the parts of ourselves that are good and bad when they come in. Uh, and so I, I, this is my very, very complicated way of saying occasionally the idea of projective identification will help make sense of the Two of Cups in a reading, because it's not necessarily about love, it's about how we come to form our sense of selves based on the incorporation of the images of other people into ourselves, um, and how other people can be at the same time good and bad to us, and how that is an important process in coming to um, form a stable sense of self, or a sense of self that one would call normal with quotes around it. So this is the exchange, this is the actual process of projective identification, or the exchange of objects that host the drives between people. Uh, the other card that I sometimes think of projective identification when it comes up is the Four of Wands, and this is purely um, 
because of the in illustration itself. So, and partially because of what the card is. So, I usually read the Four of Wands as a fully integrated sense of self. Fours are very stable. Wands representing creativity um, and and our self image and our self worth. And so, this is oftentimes the most integrated sense of self, at least in the initial line of Ace Two Three Four. This is the first time that we actually feel pretty solid. So, if this is the process of projective identification, then this would be the end result. And so, you have this structure. Right, so you have the image of the um, poles and the grapevines that are in over. It's sort of an, an enclosing structure, and then you have the little people inside. So if you take the wands as a self, this is a sense of self, a structure that is composed of people who are inside it, who have been incorporated. Maybe this is, you know, maybe this is the life drive and this is the death drive, and they've been glossed over with people or objects in the environment that have been incorporated as a part of the self. Again, I don't know how useful this is. I find it useful because this is what I study and so these meanings pop into my head when I see them. Uh, hopefully you have found it useful as a way of at least complicating the idea of love, that love is oftentimes a crazy mixture of love and hate or libido and death drive or eros and thanatos or any of the other uh, meanings that psychoanalysts have given or names that they've given them. But uh, I think that projective identification usefully complicates this process and says that love is not just love. It is also um, a process where we come to form our sense of self. It's not purely emotional. To some degree, it's also a sense of self as well. And we come through emotional bonds or we experience as emotional bonds to actually form an integrated sense of self by incorporating those bonds as psychical representations. If you have any interest in Melanie Klein, she is one of my favorites, I would suggest starting starting with this book. Her collected writings are in a much lo much larger collection of volumes, but the selected Melanie Klein um, is a pretty good introduction to some of her ideas. And uh, if you're interested in projective identification, in particular, her essay notes on some schizoid mechanisms in this book, and you can find it other places, is a really helpful introduction to her ideas. But I will warn you, until you start reading her a lot, she seems crazy. And then once you actually start getting into her, you see how useful her ideas really are. Um, that is that. Uh, I don't really have anything else to say. I have a feeling that this might be the most complicated of all the videos that I have uploaded, and I didn't practice beforehand, so it's sort of random. I hope that it made some sense to you. Leave me some comments uh, in the notes section. Let me know what you think, and hopefully I'll be back to do that Marxist gloss on the pentacles later on. Have a wonderful day.